and welcome to A Closer Look with Mark and Mark. I am Mark Miller, and this is Mark Shine. And Mark, we're starting to wind it down a little bit. The girls especially, and you've got a list I do. of the league champions. Let's take a look at that. We put together a list of the league champions. We don't have a chance to talk ladies basketball very often because our schedule is so tight, but here are the girls' teams who won each of their respective conferences. Uh, obviously, you can see where we're at there. We've got some teams. Mark, look, only one team was uh, not undefeated in conference play. Yeah, I guess you got to run the table to win a championship anymore. How about that? And you look up there and you see two familiar names on the boys' side, too. Ottawa Glandorf just about sealed that thing up all by themselves, and Liberty Benton as well. You know, they look at Upper Center Valley. They're the only ladies' team on that list that did not uh, end up ranked in the polls at the wow. end of the year as well. Here's Minster. Uh, they, this is our chance of them getting their trophy last week, too. Congratulations to them. How about Columbus Grove, though? You win two league championships yeah. and go undefeated in both of them. Well, they're pretty good. They're 21 pretty good. and one. They are. They're yep. Only one slip up. All right. Hey, plays of the week. Boy, we had some good ones, and you've well, got some fun ones to look at this week. We do. First of all, we're going to go to the NWC and what proved to be the NWC championship game. If you look at the scenario here on the scoreboard, Jefferson's up by three. We're late in the basketball game, under 17 seconds to go. If Spencerville wins, they are the league champions. If Jefferson wins, it's a tie for the championship. Watch Dakota Pritchard nail this one from about 25 feet. But then watch what happens right after this. Jay Stockwell, now the score is tied. He just gets a chance at the buzzer and leaves it just short. Or Jefferson would have won the league championship with that shot. Now we're in overtime and the score is tied. First of all, we're going to get a steal right here. Bangs the ball loose. Pritchard gets it back. Comes across mid-court. We're tied in overtime. He comes back and gets it. Here he is right here. He's going to get a screen and come this way off the screen. He went the other way off the screen the last time. And from about 27 feet, nails it. There's the game winner in overtime. We get a second look at it right here from a floor camera. This is the shot that won the NWC championship. And... Dakota Pitcher makes some big shots, had a big game, obviously, here for them. Then if we look at it here, this is from the Shelby County League. This is Rushi and Fort Laramie. Uh, Rushi, if they win this game, they are the league champions. Fort Laramie's hanging in the game, but as we play through this, you can see the score. Rushi is down one. Watch the play that they're going to run right here. We run this guy right here off a screen, and we bring the second guy right behind him right here. And my drawing screen is not working very well. He gets the ball down in low, does Kearns. He gets a shot at it and makes it in traffic. But then for Alarmy gets a chance, and they run the play to perfection. They're going to throw the ball deep to midcourt. We're going to get a catch right here. And here's that sideways pass to this guy coming to the basket. We're going to get a great shot by Evan Burning. He gets a look at it, and that kept Fort Laramie for tying for the league championship. So two big endings to league championships. You can see the Rushi Raiders, and they're celebrating there, and they head into tournament play this week. Oh, those were good ones. Yep. Hey, it's also that time of year when all league teams are starting to be thought about and coach of the year and player of the year. Well, being the progressive guys that we are, we're not waiting to see That's what right. the media says. We're going to pick our own players of the year. And so you've kind of divided it up into a couple of groups of five. So go right ahead. Well, we do. We've got a couple of lists here. And we look at our first list. Now, these are our top 10 players. This is our first five. These are done in alphabetic order. So we're not actually trying to, you know, look at anybody as being special to somebody else. Kyle Arns from uh, Versailles, Jay Kaufman, the only junior on this particular list, uh, Ethan Linder, who went over 2,000 points last weekend, Anthony Mashalas goes over 1,000 points, Jar Ward's over 1,000 points. Arns is over 1,000. Th th that's right. Thanks to the ones that Ward got when he was at Reynoldsburg as a freshman player, sophomore player there. There's our first group. Here's our second group. Derek Jay, who unfortunately has been injured lately, hasn't played due to a back problem. Drew Johnson's a junior from Pandora Gilboa. Big, strong left-handed player we're going to hear more and more about. You and I saw Tim Krieger play the other yeah. night. He's a guy who just He's keeps good. better yeah. every single year. Lane Harvey's over 1,000 as well. Almost that whole list is over 1,000. That's right. Kyle Nunn, of course, from Finley. He's had a great year. So we wanted to look at those guys and kind of highlight them a little bit. And one more we want to focus on a little bit. Micaiah Cox from down at Fort Recovery last weekend. He went over 1,000 points as well. How did he do it? Well, he scored 33 with four threes in a four-overtime win over Minster on Friday. Come back with 32 and two more three-point field goals in a win over Macomb on Saturday, and that put Micaiah Cox in the Fort Recovery 
over the thousand point mark. He's had a great year and yeah. so have the Indians. Yeah, boy, that's a, that's a heck of a list you de developed there. <coughs> and some others very deserving, but boy, well, I don't think anybody can argue that those 10 guys deserve to well, be honored. Well, we, we tried to cut it to 10 and we, you know, we could have gone another five deep yeah. or another eight deep and, and still had some quality players on the list that we had to leave off. Now let's look at our coaches there list. You go. And this one is one that we, I wrestled over and I know you did too mm -hmm. for a long, long time. What were we going to do with Coach of the Year? So we kind of went with a first team, second team again, and I decided to go with Tyson McLaughlin from OG as my pick for Coach of the Year, and here's why. They play a great schedule. They were undefeated and going into this week's game with St. Mary's in the Western Buckeye League, and he did it with just one senior. Yeah. And I think that's a tremendous accomplishment to do with an all-junior and sophomore team. His point guard was hurt for a while. I really appreciate what he did with his team this year. My second choice guy was actually your first choice guy, right? Well, I, I'm good with Tyson yeah. too. I mean, that's a heck of a, a crew he's got up there. And wait till next year, huh? Oh boy, with all those young yeah. guys. But a, a fella down the road, just south of us, a little bit at Wapak, Doug Davis. He this is his third year. He went in there, and let me get it right. 11 and 11 his first year, 13 and nine last year, and this year he's standing at 19 and two. Already tied the school record with a chance with one more game left to get that record, and he's really done it with. I don't want to call them no names, but a bunch of guys that just kind of share the wealth of different guys, the leading scorer each night, some good players, but not that marquee guy that you can kind of hang it on and say, hey, go get us 25 every game. So I think Doug Davis is a coach of the year yeah, as well. I would agree with that. And look just the number of close games that they won at Wapak, yeah. where the coach really has a, a factor in play. I know a lot of coaches say, you know, a five-point game or under is where the coach has the greatest effect. Mm -hmm. You look what Wapak's done in those type yeah. of games this year, and Doug's had a great year. So sure can't has. disagree with either one of those. And we left out some great guys. Travis yes, Swank did. down at Versailles. Yeah. He's had a great year. We can list a whole bunch of people, mm -hmm. but uh, it's been a really good year for coaches in our area, and I think that's where we're going to start right there. All right, good job. Yep. All right, we try to have a little fun with the rules. <laughs> Coach Shine becomes official Shine and, and explains rules to yep. us. Well, we travel to these games, and we think, well, I wish they'd change this rule, and you probably do the same thing. Well, we're going to share with you the rules that we wish that we would we could change right. or that we would like to see. You go first. Well, first of all, I'm going to look at this. There's a national survey that goes out when they survey coaches and officials. What rules would you like to see changed? And here were the two most prominent. One is to change the game from four quarters to two halves. Like college. Like college does. At least college men do. Now the women have gone away to a different idea. The reasoning behind that is the break between first and second quarter the break between third and fourth quarter just becomes a timeout and it's unnecessary. And think of this, what happens? It slows the game down because when you have 35 seconds left in a quarter, your team gets the ball, whoop, last shot time, and it slows the game down. If you eliminate that break between first and second quarter and between third and fourth quarter, the game has a better flow. Okay. That's why we're talking about that one. The other one involves a foul situation and that goes to the way the women are doing it now. Let's play four quarters. At the end of each quarter, we wipe out the team fouls off the scoreboard, and we start over again. You get four team fouls per quarter. The fifth one becomes not one and one, but double bonus. It's what the ladies do. They've had some success with it. Personally, I don't know, because <laughs> if you're down eight points, and you're starting the fourth quarter, and there are no fouls on that board, what are you going to do? I'm going to start fouling. It, it's assault time. <laughs> and and I'm, so I'm not really in favor of that one, but it is getting prominent mention now. The ladies like it. It's gotten a good way for them. What would I do with it? Well, I would end coaches calling timeout. I, think I agree. I like to see the players call timeout. I like to have them involved in that situation. I saw a college game the other night. The coach is calling timeout, which he can't do, and the official is yelling at the player, call timeout, call timeout. <laughs> Your coach wants you to. So... I, I, but I would. I, I like to, to go back to that idea. And then I like a rule. It, it involves a 10-second rule in the backcourt, and it would reward the defensive team. Right now, you inbound the ball. You're dribbling up. You get trapped. There's seven seconds left, or you've used seven seconds off the clock, and you're 10 seconds to get the ball over midcourt. Timeout, and we take the ball out of bounds. You get 10 more seconds. I would like to see a rule put in where you get the balance of that 10 seconds to get the ball over midcourt once the timeout comes to an end. So you've used eight seconds. Timeout. The official goes to both coaches. There are two seconds left on the clock to get the ball over midcourt. I think that rewards the defense a little bit more and maybe would encourage more full court pressing in our games. I like that one. I, I think that'd be, reward that'd be the great defense. for the game. We're always rewarding offense. Let's reward the defense. Absolutely. You, you played that great press for seven, eight seconds, timeout, and you get a whole new 10 seconds. Yeah. This would reward the defense. I like it. Yep. I've got just one. 
and then we're going to talk about yeah. some things that we talk about all the time. But but it, and you've already alluded to it, and that is trying to cut timeouts out. You know, going the the half thing would do it because you cut out the first and third quarter timeout. Uh, but I I, I it started out with four sixties. Went to 360s, 220s, those have morphed into 60s, so now you have yeah. 560s, plus halftime, plus first quarter, plus third quarter. And if you save them like Coach Segerson used to, <laughs> you got them all in the last yeah. two minutes of the game. I'd like to see them whack out some of those timeouts. But we disagree on a couple of things, yep. and we each have our own points, right. and that's okay. One is the shot clock. I like the shot clock idea because I think it would increase scoring and make teams shoot more towards the end of a period. You don't like the well, shot. I, I don't. And, and here's why. I, I think that dictates something that we don't always need. You and I did Spencerville and Crestview a couple weeks ago. Score was in the low 40s. Did you ever feel it was a delay game situation no. going on? No. It was two teams working the ball to get a good shot. Uh, nobody likes that guy who stands at midcourt and hands the ball. And, and nobody likes that. But as long as a team is making an effort to score, I, I would prefer not to have a shot clock. I do wish coaches weren't the control freaks that they are now. And we got the game going up and down a little bit more. But... I'm not a shot clock okay. guy. And the other thing that we disagree on is that semicircle under the basket, yep. like the pros have gone to. <laughs> College, you do that too? Yeah. Okay. Yep. And, and that kind of indicates if your feet are inside or outside, it's a charge or a block. And, and I'd kind of like to see that because I see some of the young guys setting up right underneath the basket, and a guy leaves the floor to go up and make a layup, and there's contact, and the official has to make a call. But you don't like the semicircle. I, I don't. And, and mostly from my official standpoint, because yeah. it's one more thing the official has to look for. I talked to an official about that the other day. In college games now, they're actually standing with their foot on the line. And when the charge occurs, they lift their foot up. Mm. So their toes are in front of the line, but their heels are no longer on it anymore. And it's just one more thing for the official to yeah. look at. I think, it's little, I think it just becomes yeah. more complicated. Hey, one thing we do agree on, yep. and that is the national anthem. We think that is a, a, a sacred time. We think it's a time to show your patriotism, to show your respect to a lot of uh, people that have gone before us. And we have seen a trend towards lots of other activity during the national anthems. We see student sections swaying back and forth. We see teams locking arms and doing some kind of rhythmic uh, dance. And to be quite honest with you, we see cheerleaders in lockstep after the first stanza of the national anthem doing something with their arms. We don't know what that is. Yeah. I don't like that. I think we should be still. You've got a thing that you, well, is kind of official. Yeah, actually, uh, I'm a government teacher, so I've actually had to do some research on this. The United States law says during the national anthem, it's hand over heart. And I just think we should all do that. We should encourage our students, our cheerleaders, our players, our fans to do that and just make it a habit. And I think it would be a symbol of patriotism and a little bit more respect for that in National Anthem. Here, here. Okay. All right. Hey, we got some games coming up. We're going to finish off some league games. And, and a lot of the leagues have been decided, but maybe just co-championships at this point. So a lot to play for yet and getting some momentum to go into a uh, tournament. So you got a game yeah, tomorrow I'm night. Wednesday night, yeah. yeah. Lips, Lipsick and Liberty Benton play. If, if Liberty Benton wins, they win the championship outright. So why is it a big game? Well, Lipsick, 13-7. and seven, They're 8-2 and two in the BVC. Grant Schrader averages 15.8 points a game and three assists. Jordan Berger, 11.1 points per game, 9.1 assists or 9.1 rebounds as well. They're a good, solid basketball team. What's it mean for Liberty Benton? Well, they're now 18-3 and three after winning on Monday night. They are 10-0 and 0 in the BVC. A win gives them the outright championship uh, in the conference of the BVC. Now, we know Anthony Mastrolasco averaging 24.5 points a game. Austin May 11.4 with 45 threes on the year. They have added Will Poling in the last 10 games. He averages about 7 points a game. He can also shoot the three. It gave him one more offensive weapon. We did that great game that they had with Van Buren that went overtime. Yeah. If they win, they end up being 11-0 in conference play. Van Buren, of course, hoping for a Lipsick win. Yeah. Van Buren has River, uh, Riverdale at home on Friday night. If, if Lipsick can win the game, it makes Riverdale and Van Buren game a big game. See if Van Buren can get a piece of the pie as well. All right, let's look into PCL. This is for the championship. Pandora Gilboa, 14-6 overall. They're 5-1 in the league. Continental, they play at Continental, who's 13-7. Four and two in the league, just a game behind. PG lost to Liberty Benton last Friday in a good game, 67-63. Drew Johnson, who's having a great season, put in 25. Continental beat Kaleida on Friday night, a good win. Wyatt Stauffer, another guy that went over 1,000 this year, had 26. And then they came back and beat Tenor. But they have a game tonight at Ridgemont, so they've got all kinds yeah. of basketball to play. But that should be a good one. That is for the PCL championship. Just one more mention on Corey Ross, and they play – Friday night in the BBC at Pandora Gilboa, but they have won six in a row. 
Corey Rossin, the Hornets coming on strong late in the year. Yeah, watch out for Corey in the tournament, see if that draw they got. They could do some damage there. Let's also move to the Western Buckeye League and what's going on there. We know that, uh, that St. Mary's and OG play. If OG wins, they are the outright league champion and undefeated. Strong chance that's going to happen, particularly with Derek Jay on the injury list for St. Mary's. And even if he comes back, even though St. Mary's has beaten him in the past in similar situations, OG will be the favorite. But our game we want to talk about, Wapak, 19-2, 7-1, and Van Wert, 12-9, 4-4. That's where you and I will be. Be a good one. Van Wert has won five out of the last six games. Had kind of a clunker over at Carroll, Indiana in the middle there, but they've won five out of the last six. Nate plays, Jake Kelly, they can score. Van Wert's and one of those teams that are good and could have been even better. They have four losses by four points or less and another game they lost in overtime. They also played OG to a 67-63 game in the regular season. And if they could get by St. Mary's and perhaps an Elida team that's struggling a little bit lately, Van Wert would match up with uh, OG again in the tournament. This is a really big game for both teams as they prep for the tournament and get going. You've covered uh, Wapak a little bit while ago when yeah. you talked about Doug Davis and his team. Big game in the, in the league, not necessarily for league championship, although a small chance that could occur, but to prep for the tournament. That's exactly right. Hey, let's go to the MAC, Marion Local. 13-8, 6-2, they play at Coldwater, 9-12, 4-4. Marion Local won over New Knoxville on Friday night and then beat Rushi 50-43. That's a good win for them. Coldwater lost to Wapak on Saturday, but in two overtimes, 79-73, and had four guys going to double figures. Anytime you can get Toby, Albers winning, Mullenkamp scoring double figures, you got a chance to win. And, hey, who knows, a football game may break out. <laughs> It'd be a heck of a football game, wouldn't it? Hey, let's put up our games that we got coming up this weekend. Gain of momentum, getting on into tournament. Look at all these games, some great ones. And then we got some wrestling down at the bottom, some girls sectional finals as they go into the tournament earlier than the boys. Should be a lot of fun. Tune in, follow us all the way to Columbus. Should be a good ride. We can't wait. All right, that's another closer look. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next week.